And today we have uh, two eminent speakers, Dr. Indra Gupta and Dr. Madhuri Kanikar. And the session will be moderated by Dr. Rajiv Sinha. And the highlight of the session is we have polling session for the trainees and we have cash rewards for that as well. I request Dr. Amrish Chain to introduce the uh, moderator of the day, Dr. Rajiv Sinha. Over to Dr. Amrish. Thank you, Dr. Kalavani. Um, you know, good evening, everybody in India, and uh, good morning here on the east side. Rajiv Sena. Dr. Rajiv Sena is a professor of pediatrics and head of the Department of Pediatric Nephrology Institute of Child Health, Kolkata. He is also a consultant pediatric nephrologist in Apollo Genesis Hospital, Kolkata. His special academic interests include renal replacement ther therapy, including transplantation, and he is also interested in studying ambulatory blood pressure monitoring in children with hypertension. He has received multiple travel grants from ISN, IPNA, and other societies. He is an International Society of Nephrology Education Ambassador. He has received honorary membership of National Board of Medical Sciences in India, and he has published more than 50 articles in both national and international peer-reviewed journals. He is also the member of the Special Project Subcommittee on Acute Kidney Injury and Zero by 25, of the International Pediatric Nephrology Association. Please welcome Dr. Rajiv Sena. Over to you, Dr. Sena. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amris, for the kind introduction. And uh, at the start, uh, obviously, I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Kalaiwani and uh, Professor Namalwar sir again for uh, continuing uh, this uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kalaiwani's uh, enthusiasm for teaching all of us. And uh, she does uh, pick up uh, a focus topic. And uh, this time it has been Kakut. And uh, today I'm really honored and privileged to be a, a part of this endeavor and uh, to moderate a session where we have, have uh, real stalwarts in uh, uh, Dr. Madhuri Kanitkar and Dr. Indra Gupta. So, um, I think without wasting much time, we will uh, sort of start the session. Our first talk will be by Dr. Madhuri Kanitkar, who really, really needs no introduction, uh, be it in pediatric nephrology com community or in pediatric community, and in fact, uh, uh, even in the in any medical community and and across. Like uh, she has been really a stalwart in in everything, and uh, she is someone there which. Uh, whom we all pediatric nephrologists do look up to. Dr. Madhuri Kankar is currently a vice chancellor in the Maharashtra University of Health Science and is also a member of this Prime Minister's Science, Technology and Innovation Advisory Council. She was, as we all know, in the, in the army and had, uh, had uh, uh, rose up to in the rank. She was the uh, only third woman in the Indian Armed Force to be promoted to this three-star rank. And uh, as I said before, that uh, we, all of us in the pediatric nephrology community is really proud to be associated with her. And uh, right from the time when I came back from UK, I've been uh, hearing her uh, bladder talk. And, uh, and I do uh, like to call her as a bladder ma'am. So, uh, madam, it is up to you for the first talk. At the outset, uh, Rajiv, thank you so much for those very, very kind words. It's a pleasure being associated with you. And I'd like to thank Kailwani and uh, Professor Namalwar for inviting me and getting me back to my uh, people mostly are, you know, uh, very happy with the glamorous, glomerulous and feel that the bladder is boring. But people now have realized the value and the importance of the bladder, which can control the glomerulus. And with that, I would like to start sharing my screen. If you, this thing, is my screen visible? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so if, uh, you can, if you can make it a full yeah, screen. I yeah. will be making it yeah. into a full screen. So uh, it is, uh, like I said, bladder has been my first love in nephrology and uh, I've been working in voiding disorders in children, uh, 
for a long time initially aneurysms then dysfunctional voiding and a lot of uh, this thing and uh, uh, taking it further now as a uh, vice chancellor and working with uh, medtech to have some new solutions in this uh, so my talk today is would be the outline and objective of the talk would be to be able uh, those who have joined in uh, should be able to suspect a child when the child has a voiding disorder, define a functional voiding disorder and the terminology used when we talk of voiding disorders, enumerate the effects that voiding disorders would have on the kidney, other investigations, order investigations and interpret them, how to treat a child with the voiding disorder and then counsel a child for bladder retraining. So I will start with a few cases. Uh, for those who this thing, they have been my real teaching cases for many years. This little girl avoids using the toilet many, but many times a day she squats on the floor and has some wetting of undergarments with repeated UTIs. And if you see her MCU, it has this huge little reflux and a DMSA scan, there's one kidney missing. Whereas this seven-year-old boy had aneurysis along with severe constipation, fecal incontinence. So the problems were bedwetting and constipation and even a plain skygram of the abdomen shows how loaded this thing is. Uh, another eight-year-old boy whose parents said he voids only two times a day, but in between that he wets his pants both in the day and night and is constipated. He also has some urinary tract infections. And uh, if you look at this, it's such a bad bladder with a very high uh, reflux present on both sides. Whereas this girl, the parents had brought uh, her to me for recurrent urinary tract infections. She would squat and take this position using her heel into the perineum and uh, continuously being on antibiotics for dysuria, urgency, in fact, when they came to me in the six, last three months, six months, she had three of these symptoms. Whereas this girl had infrequent voiding and look at that, she's using a, like a greedy manure. Every time she wanted to void, she had to actually push her hands down into the lower abdomen to get the urine out. So this, these are some of those situations where children come with very different kinds of voiding problems. What I'd like to say in the beginning is that Every child with a wet bed is not just aneurysis. So the commonest cause would be aneurysis. But as we have more and more literature coming in, that unless we look for it and find an underlying voiding disorder, it may not be pure simple aneurysis. And the same thing that every child with recurrent UTI may need more than just antibiotics, prophylaxis, looking out for a reflux, what we've heard for years. So situations in a clinical scenario when we would suspect that the bladder is behaving badly. The children getting recurrent urinary tract infections, especially girls, a visicouretric reflux that does not resolve with time, bedwetting with daytime symptoms or bedwetting which is refractive to your normal treatment, bowel dysfunction and incontinence, what we looked at, like the Hinman bladder, which looks like a very bad neurogenic bladder, but there's no neurogenic problems, and the renal functions are deteriorating. Or boys work who have been operated for posterior urethral valves, but have renal deterioration. So as just to quickly recapitulate the functions of the bladder, it stores urine at low pressure, which is under good neuroanatomical control, and it is supposed to empty at a socially acceptable time and empty to completion with no post-void residues. But when this goes wrong for some reason, the child is wet. And that is in a broad a term called incontinence. Incontinence is of two basic types, which is continuous, wherein the child may be dribbling the whole day and night, or it's intermittent, where large amounts of urine are passed and in between those periods, the child may be dry. So both these uh, are continuous could be primary or secondary and most of the continuous incontinence is due to a neuroanatomical problem and the prototype is our neurogenic bladders and when we have a meningomyelocele or a transverse myelitis or a spinal injury, 
and these children continue to dribble continuously. At times, there may be even an ectopic ureter, and that may be an anatomical reason where there's continuous dribbling through day and night. But when it's intermittent, it could be just at night, which is your nocturnal enuresis, or it may have daytime symptoms. And a large number of children who are present with nocturnal enuresis as they grow may have the daytime symptoms which are missed unless we really take a good history or ask for avoiding diary, which I'll come to in a while. So therefore, uh, continuous is constant urine leakages and applies to all ages. Whereas intermittent is urine leakage in discrete amounts. And generally we talk of it when after five years or once continence has been achieved by the child. So therefore, bladder dysfunction could be because of an abnormal anatomy, as I said, an ectopic ureter, or it could be an abnormal innervation, which is the neurogenic bladder. But what happens when both these are normal? Normal anatomy, normal innervation, and yet the child has intermittent uh, leaking and uh, wetting. And though that comes under the broad classification of voiding disorders, which are dysfunctional or abnormal functional problems. And like I said, the bladder had two functions. One was uh, filling and the other was evacuation. So imagine if filling, when if the bladder is supposed to expand as a watertight compartment to capacity very smoothly, if this doesn't happen and the bladder keeps contracting during the filling phase, you have an overactive bladder and these involuntary contractions during filling can cause intermittent leaks. The problem, if it's during evacuation, can be because of the fact that either the bladder is not contracting well enough or the bladder is also contracting and the sphincter is also contracting. So the bladder has to push against a closed sphincter and this sphincter could be internal or external using the pelvic muscles during voiding. And this results in dysfunctional voiding. And over time, when these bladders become lax, it's like a rubber band or an elastic which is stretched for too long. It cannot go back to its own shape. And that may happen to an underactive bladder, which is a large, capacious bladder with poor contractility. So these are some of the voiding disorders. There are specific terminology which are described in voiding disorders and that they are given in standard textbooks. I'll draw your attention to two important ones, which is when do you say the frequency of voiding is abnormal? That is, if it is increased, if there is the child voids more than eight times a day and we say the frequency is decreased if the child voids less than three times a day. And the other things like an urgency, nocturia, I think most textbooks would give it. And another important point I would like to do is holding maneuvers. Because in history, we need to really ask where children tend to cross their legs, jump up and down, get into squatting positions to try and avoid leakage of urine. And in girls, another important thing is vaginal reflux. They hurry up, they do not void in a relaxed manner, and the urine refluxes into the vagina. So when they Get up after some time, this leaks out into the undergarments. So what are the consequences of bladder dysfunction? If the bladder fails to empty and if the pressures start rising, there is increased bladder pressure. And this has a pop-off phenomena on the ureters with hydroureters, hydronephrosis, and leading to high pressure changes. And it goes down to the tubules, the kidneys start getting damaged. Also, if it doesn't evacuate in a relaxed manner, there is colonization and these bacteria do not, because there is residual urine, they are easily multiplying in here and that can cause recurrent cystitis. So what is the role of the bladder in vasicoureteric reflux? In fact, uh, it is now felt that there may be urodynamic dysfunction in even up to 46.3% of infants with primary VUR. And these may be the children where the UR, VUR does not reduce with time. And so there are recommendations that even UTS may be informed, but this is easier said than done, and we would probably look at more non-invasive methods. 
So once we have this situation like I described, how do we start evaluating? First step, like I said, we'll find out whether the continence is continuous or intermittent. And this particular talk will be restricted to the intermittent because continuous is anatomical or neurologic and would be handled in a different way. A good history of whether the child was ever dry, does he have any daytime symptoms like we described, how many episodes of urinary tract infection, what is the stream like, or past surgery for valves, constipation, a very important history. Does the child drink enough water? Most children during the day do not drink. And are there any psychological issues, especially in adolescents who have wetting? And there's an acronym of HEGS, that is Home Environment, Education, Activities, Drugs, Sexuality, and Suicide or Depression. So those are some psychological disorders. And a good family history is also important because aneurysm is being run in families. A clinical management tool was described in 2012 which in a busy OPD can be used as a questionnaire. And I draw your attention to this old reference. And these are some of the positions that children might take when they are trying to avoid and they're getting bladder contractions, but they don't want to let the urine pass out. There are associations with voiding disorders like you're holding maneuvers, constipation, poor stream, or inadequate fluid intake. And this was in one of our studies, which is being published. And now more and more we are realizing that voiding disorders are not just of the bladder, but bladder and bowel are embryologically connected together, neurologically connected together, anatomically sharing the same space. And the uh, problem of one affects the other. So therefore, a child who does not drink more water may have get symptoms which get aggravated in the evening. They tend to reduce fluid intake to minimize the wetting. And these powerful pelvic flow contraction leads to postponement of defecation because the pelvic flow is trying to stop leaking of urine and there may be postponement of defecation. The net result of the two is constipation and a loaded bowel presses on the bladder which further worsens bladder functioning. And a dysfunctional elimination score has also been described to really see how severe this is. So this is how one thing can lead to the other. And therefore, evaluation can be done of the constipation with a good history. The Bristol stool chart, which describes the type of stool, an abdominal examination, a rectal examination, an x-ray abdomen taken for any other reason does show lo loaded uh, bowels. And even a rectal diameter on ultrasound, which shows a more than two centimeters, may be significant. And this will have to be evaluated in every child. If there is no question of escaping a good clinical examination, just to rule out that there is no urogeologic abnormality, such as a pest cavus or a tuft of hair, a good urine analysis, and a 24-hour urine output, because the, a child may be... A, a, uh, incontinent because of polyuria. And this could be because of either a diabetes mellitus or a, a smaller load or a diabetes insipidus. So if the child is passing more than 5 mils of kg per hour or more than 2, or 2 liters per meter square per day, that is defined as polyuria and needs to be evaluated right in the beginning. And uh, this is again just to break the monotony this young boy was brought in with a good, how a good history helped. The uh, two brothers were just a year and a half apart, but there was a huge difference in their size. And it was on detailed evaluation, he was found uh, poor performance at school, wetting the bed, but his problem was obesity and an obstructive sleep apnea, which when treated, his neurosis improved. Imaging of the spine is probably overemphasized of spina bifida, maybe a coincidental finding. But however, if there is dribbling, continuous clinical ex examination is abnormal, or there's a Christmas tree bladder on the uh, micturating cystic erythrogram, which I'll show you, we may still go in for imaging of the spine. And in case there's a high index of suspicion or refractive dysfunction and voiding, we would have to rule out a tethered cord. So a clinical examination, these are some of the things which are well published. Besides a good general examination, genitalia, examination of the underwear, 
inspection of lumbar sacral spine, a urine biochemistry just to rule out glucosuria or proteinuria, and a urine microscopy to consider UTI. I think a basic simple examination to begin with, a good history is enough. So therefore, if you have a child with incon intermittent incontinence, that is daytime wetting, look at the urinary stream, neuro examination, and probably just a routine examination. If there are WBCs, we may think of a culture. If everything is negative, we may need not go in for a major investigation, probably add avoiding diary. And if it's positive, then we go in for further evaluation. So let's get into what is step one, which is non. Uh, I, I, I just move this down. This is amazing. Yeah. So, uh, what is non-invasive urodynamics? It starts with a good voiding diary, which is on at least two uh, days where the child is not at school. A frequency volume charting of urine. I'll show you in a while. And the amount of fluid intake. We could even make it into a bladder bowel diary over a week, which gives uh, how what is the stool pattern and how often is the child or is he constipated, followed with an ultrasound examination and a micturating cystoerythrogram. I'll draw your attention to a USG where not just the kidney size correlated to the age, but we need to look at the bladder. We would look at the bladder wall thickness, any hydrourethronephrosis, and more important, a post-void residue, which should be looked at immediately after the child has passed urine because a delay in that may give a wrong calculation. And a micturating cystourethrogram, if indicated for recurrent UTI. Otherwise, we go a little lesser. Nothing like observing voiding because I found this I, uh, in lighter vein, one calls it a uh, uh, observation uh, 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 sort of euroflowmetry where what is the posture that if it's a small child and he agrees to let you or you could ask the mother to explain the posture, the kind of stream and abdominal effort that is taken and if there is any post-maturation dribbling. Avoiding diary would mean recording the urine output for every, every time the child passes urine and what is the fluid intake along with any accidents. And most important again is this requirement to look at more than eight times a day or less than three times a day. And compare the voided volume, that is the maximum voided volume, to the expected bladder capacity. And we use the uh, simple formula, age in years plus two into 30 beyond infancy. So if we have an expected bladder capacity of five-year-old child, you do five plus two, seven, seven into 30, we would expect a 210 mils is the capacity. And there's no reason that the child needs to pass urine at least 50 to 75% of its filling. So if it's passing 30, 30, 40 ml at each time, obviously it is small frequent void. Uh, the nocturnal polyuria is another thing which we would like to know, especially if the nighttime wetting is much more, because some children may have more of enuresis along with the voiding disorder because this nocturnal bladder capacity is reduced. And this is, is an expected ca of capacity of the overnight void urine output is about 130% of the expected bladder capacity for age. Uh, there's a poor correlation between nocturnal bladder capacity versus maxi maximum voided volume during the day. And these are some studies later which showed that this may not, what happens during the day may not be relevant at night. We did a work of looking at the clinical management tool versus a voiding diary. And when maintained in the same child, the voiding diary could pick up seven extra cases than what the clinical management tool could do in a cohort of 100 patients. And this was important. So I would think that at the end of this uh, web series, if we all learn to ask for a voiding diary and interpret it, it would be useful. An ultrasonography, when a full bladder, the posterior wall thickness is more than two millimeters, 
a capacity of the systematic capacity compared to avoided volume, and more important, a post void residue. If it's more than 20 mils, I think that is very significant that there is either a reflux or the child is not evacuated to completion. And this is what I meant at the abnormal bladders. This is a classical spinning top urethra and could happen in a child with an overactive bladder or a Christmas tea bladder, typically in a neurogenic or a Hinman's bladder, where it's sort of, and if you see a bladder like this, before uh, the thing, we might uh, prefer to have a, uh, think of either cord and get an MRI of the spine type. So non-invasive urodynamics versus voiding disorders, just looking at, like I said, a good ultrasound, avoiding diary, and a history. We found that uh, nocturnal enuresis with daytime symptoms, holding maneuvers, small frequent voiding patterns, small capacity bladder, and an insignificant post-void residue could pick up with a very high sensitivity specificity and likelihood ratio of 3.9. Whereas dysfunctional voiding was associated with straining, recurrent UTI, infrequent voiding, large capacity bladders, significant post void residues in the absence of a vesicouretric reflux. So I think these are basic guidelines where which help you predict the kind of underlying dysfunct voiding problem in any child who comes with recurrent UTIs. And I like you see, it's so simple. An ultrasound, a good history, an avoiding diary, and you can be quite uh, good about predicting the underlying disorder. Because urodynamic studies are quite invasive. The, in step one, you do just a flow, a uh, volume and flow metry. It may be associated with EMG pelvic muscles, but a systometry is a in invasive procedure wherein you're looking for, you have to put a lot of uh, probes in the abdomen for abdominal wall, uh, abdominal pressures with a rectal probe, uh, bladder probe. And this is some place where we are doing some research to look at a little more non-invasive ways of recording these methods. And what is important is any pressures going more than 40 centimeters during filling or more than 70 centimeters during voiding is abnormal. And sphincter's pressure during bladder contraction increasing is also abnormal. So to summarize indications of UTS being invasive, we wouldn't do it unless there was a poor response to treatment of avoiding disorder as predicted with non-invasive urodynamics, anorectal anomalies, neurogenic bladder, abnormal voiding with fecal incontinence, and a trabeculation seen on the bladder, or is like a Christmas tree bladder, or sphincter spasms noted during MCU for associated UTIs. So if you really think, and this, uh, or a neurogenic bladder does require a neurodynamic uh, study, and any abnormalities after uh, a, a valve bladder, as I explained, the operation of a posterior urethral valve, if, especially if that child has deteriorated, and we need to address and handle the bladder before we go in for a transplant, we would definitely do a urodynamic study. Now that we've diagnosed it, how do we treat it? I think a very simple method. We start with constipation. Like I said, bowel affects the bladder. So let's address the bowel first. And this is usually done with use of laxatives and behavioral modification in diet. Lactulose or peg can be used. It may, even if it's impacted, we may, to begin with, need some enemas. And we need to treat, treat treatment for three to six months to ensure the bowel has started moving in a very regular manner. If And thereafter, if it's an overactive bladder, after treating constipation and uh, getting motivation from the child, we start the bladder re-education, which is like bladder training of an infant who we'd like to take at timely intervals to void and I'll come to counseling in a while. If it's an overactive bladder, yes. We, if it's a enuresis uh, uh, primarily with nocturnal polyuria, we might want to do desmopressin. But otherwise, if it's an overactive bladder by itself, we would use uh, 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 oxybutynin, tolterodine or darfenosine. So these would help in relax the bladder. For dysfunctional voiding, we would treat constipation, 
treat infections and consider antibiotic prophylaxis because UTIs would keep the bladder more irritable. So we treat the UTI first, ensure adequate fluid education, fluid intake and a bladder re-education. In that, there should be a scheduled voiding regime with increasing intervals. So if you find that the wetting is occurring every hour, we might start with timely voiding, voiding in a relaxed manner. This child, this is not relaxed. The feet have to be either resting on a stool or the Indian type of a toilet with the child squatting and in a relaxed manner, teach the child to void completely. Positive reinforced by the pediatrician is very, very important. And biofeedback, yoga, computer games have also been reported. So uh, how do you go about the counseling for uh, dysfunctional voiding? Firstly, it needs a lot of patience and active participation of the child. So you have to take the child into confidence. Child needs to understand what is happening. So we can show little pictorial pictures. Explain how the abdomen is contracting, the pelvic muscles are contracting and you, we can use a balloon to show that how, if the air has to go out, how the mouth has to relax and what the child is doing. So we need to use all these kind of to explain to the child and then teach using hands over abdominal walls, teaching them how to do by coughing or pulling in the pelvic muscles, how to contract and relax. So this is done over time and they are explained to do this every time the child wants to pass urine. Take the correct posture. Biofeedback is extremely useful. Double voiding in case of recurrent UTIs and a frequent monitoring by the treating doctor encouraging the child goes a very long way. Uh, in spite of that, if we have large residuals volume in dysfunctional voiding with a damaging kidney, we might need a matrafenov and a continuous in, uh, uh, intermittent catheterization. So clean intermittent catheterization may be required for large residual volumes which cause recurrent UTIs and may have become, uh, happened because of a large capacious bladder which has gone into an atonic. I think follow up with a bladder diary is very important. When a child comes and she can show how every day she's fast in the correct time and how many times, how it reduces the number of accidents and the doctor encourages the patient, they feel very, very good about it and they continue and that is how you can keep increasing the duration by which they need to go and call. And at each check, when they come, we need to have a follow-up wherein the bladder diary and enuresis episodes are checked. The child is rewarded just like in pure uh, enuresis. Check the bowel habits, the fluid intake. And this is important because children in school to avoid dirty bathrooms may not drink fluid and they drink all in the evening. And that may cannot have enough and that worsens constipation. So asking them to have measured amounts for the age and finishing most of it in the first half or by four o'clock in the evening really helps the child. Treating urinary tract infections or have they had any breakthrough infections. Ultrasounds which show reducing post void residues, re improving bladder wall thickness it shows Parents and child feels very encouraged to see that they're doing well. And of course, if there has been upper tract changes, monitoring kidney growth, monitoring child's growth, looking for the VUR, renal functions and psychological evaluation and school performance may also uh, be taken as a feedback. And this is some of the studies which show the outcome of pelvic exercises, dysfunctional voiding, that it really helped in all the symptoms by using pelvic relaxation during voiding. So the key messages are that a functional voiding disorder needs to be considered in a child presenting with recurrent urinary tract infections, nocturnal enuresis with daytime symptoms. The child may not come out with it, but avoiding diary and specific questions and a good history will help bring it out. If there is daytime wetting, and if the child has had posterior urethral valves operated, then we need to follow up such children for any bladder dysfunctions. A structured pattern of evaluation 
of a good history, a clinical examination, and a basic urinary uh, investigation, followed by an ultrasound and avoiding diary. And then trying and interpreting all this, Try. we can start treatment in most cases where required a systometry and neurodynamic study, and then we would start treatment. For that, we would always start with treating the constipation consistently and correctly and for a good duration and get that relieved and sorted out first. Ensure the child is taking adequate fluid during the day and then bladder retraining forms the cornerstone. Judicious use of anticholinergics may be of this. I've just put a little uh, a case for uh, as a wind up to see for where you can test yourselves what you learned in this class. My uh, the mother came with an eight year old boy. He had occasional wetting for past two years. He needs to use the toilet very often, and his teachers have complained that he's every period he says, "I need to go to the toilet. I need to use the washroom." So, if you can note down for yourselves what were the problems. I give you 10 seconds to just recapitulate what we've discussed. You can note them down. So he has wetting, he has frequent voiding, and you can see how when asked in the clinic, what do you do when you can't run? Just see how he's using a holding manure. When I asked for the voiding diary, look at this. So you can now evaluate that, like I mentioned, he's an eight-year-old boy. But look at the amount of times he's going to the toilet. 30 mil, 25 mil, 25 mil. And if he's 8 years old, we discussed that his bladder capacity should be 8 plus 2, 10. 10 into 30, 300. He should not have to go to the toilet till at least 50%. That is 150 mils. But he is needing to rush so very often. So I think by now, you've got the answer quite correct that he does seem to have a frequent voiding pattern. But why is he doing that? Like, is it a pure overactive bladder or is there a sphincter problem? So we did his Euroflow. And look, this is the Euroflow, which shows he squirts something out, then he stops, then he squirts something out, then he stops, then he squirts something out. This is typically called a staccato voiding. So he just doesn't empty, empty his bladder. He's just passing small amounts. So obviously he has to run every time and he passes this small, small quantities like this. When we looked at his systometry, uh, it, it, we saw that the filling, when he was having the filling, this was, look at this, uh, uh, infusion is beginning. And even when the vesicle pressures are about 30, uh, the uh, that is inside the bladder, your centimeters of water is 127 and it's all detrusor. So it is a detrusor's pressure which is increasing. So his bladder is trying to contract. But at the same time, he's not able to empty out because though his bladder is this, can you see this is his EMG? And every time he's wanting to void out, the external sphincter is going into a spasm, leading to a staccato void. So this is a typical case of a staccato voiding voiding disorder and that is how you start treating in the same way with constipation etc. And uh, I end my talk here. But I'll hand over back to the moderator to let us uh, take it further. Thank you ma'am uh, for that excellent talk of uh, summarizing this uh, vast topic into uh, 30 minutes. Uh, it is difficult, but I'm sure that uh, uh, many of us uh, learned a lot from that. And uh, your message that we have been trying to percolate uh, is uh, the importance of voiding diary, something which is uh, easily done. And uh, I think should be a part and parcel of uh, all pediatricians, not even pediatric nephrologists, all pediatricians. So uh, we will take uh, questions at the end of the uh, full session and uh, we go on to the next session and again it's a privilege to introduce uh, Professor Indra Gupta. Uh, Professor Gupta is uh, 
professor in the uh, Department of Pediatrics at Montreal Children's Hospital and is also an associate member of the Department of Human Genetics and Department of Experimental Medicine at the McGill University of uh, in Canada. She is a senior scientist and deputy director of, of Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center. And uh, she has a special interest in uh, uh, understanding the molecular and the cellular mechanisms of uh, congen congenital anomalies of kidney and urinary tracts. And uh, uh, I've been hearing a, a lot about her uh, from uh, Dr. Uh, Martin Virgin, like uh, with whom uh, all of us are, are nowadays more closely associated as he has moved over to Dubai. So, Professor Gupta, it is up to you. Now, over to you for uh, your uh, talk. Thank you very much. There we go. Can everyone see my slides? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sinha, for that very nice introduction. and. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed Dr. Kanekar's presentation, so I'll hope to link at least a few aspects of my talk today uh, with uh, the beautiful lecture you just heard. So, a uh, brief outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, this case uh, review of the diagnoses that we consider within uh, congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract, which we're going to abbreviate with this term kakut. We're going to talk a little bit about etiologies of kakut and then the long-term prognosis. So we'll start with a case. Um, so a newborn male presented with irritability and fever and poor feeding at three weeks of age. And one day prior to, to presentation, he also had gross hematuria that was noted in the diaper by the parents. So this is a pretty classic presentation of some type of newborn illness, uh, looks like some type of infection. It's pointing to the urinary tract, of course, because there's gross hematuria. So we did the standard lab investigations, including a serum creatinine. I put it in uh, both units because uh, we use the SI units. Um, uh, the, the baby had high, a high white blood cell count in the blood, consistent with some type of infection, and had a lot of white blood cells in the urine, so pyuria, and the urine culture grew E. coli. So this is looking like uh, potentially uh, blood sepsis with urosepsis, um, based on this presentation. So no surprise, we went on to do an ultrasound and you can see from this ultrasound that this, this baby boy had very abnormal looking kidneys. So the right kidney is shown here. You can see a very bright hypercoic cortex and you see this dilated pelvis extending into the calyces. That's the right kidney and the left kidney, you probably see even less cortex in that kidney. And again, gross dilation of both the pelvis and the calyces. So pretty significant um, bilateral hydronephrosis is what we're seeing. And I'm going to call this renal dysplasia, although it, to be a purist, renal dysplasia is really a histological diagnosis. But typically, we diagnose it because these kidneys are not often biopsied based on the appearance on ultrasound of a hyperchoa kidney with poor cortical medullary differentiation. Sometimes cysts can be also seen. Sometimes the kidneys are also very small when you measure kidney length. So this is bilateral hydrounephrosis or hydronephrosis. We don't see the ureters and there were no big dilators at the ureter at the bladder level, as I recall. And so your working diagnosis at this point would be really two main diagnoses. So the number one most common diagnoses we heard about in Dr. Kennekar's talk would be vesicoureteric reflux, and the second would be posterior valves. So to diagnose either of those, you would go on to the voiding cystiurethrogram, which we did. Oh, my slide's not advancing, sorry. There we go. And the voiding cystiurethrogram showed here when the bladder was filled, you have the bladder normally should be nice and smooth walled, a nice balloon, but you see it's irregular and there's small trabeculations all over the place. And when you look at the images after the baby is voided, you, this is a sagittal view. You see this irregular bladder and a dilated posterior urethra. So this really nails your diagnosis. And this is just the description, dilation of the bladder neck and posterior urethra with stenosis at the junction of the posterior and anterior urethra with a trabeculated bladder. So this is classic posterior urethral valves with bilateral renal dysplasia. So this is a pretty horrific diagnosis because 
not only do you need to manage the kidney disease and the chronic kidney disease that will arise, but you also need to deal with the bladder issues, which aren't trivial. So just to review, um, posterior urethral valves, this is again a sagittal view of the bladder. So here's the bladder lumen, here's the penis, and it's a defect where you get congenital persistence of this membrane in within the urethra. So it's unique to boys, of course, and it, is, it comes with an incidence as high as one in 5,000 to one 8,000 male births. And the surgical treatment is obliteration of the membrane. And often, you know, the initial treatment is to put a catheter in these babies, and that already perforates the membrane, um, but usually they need more definitive resection by a cystoscopy with, with more better removal of the valves. So that is posterior urethral valves is one diagnosis along the spectrum of abnormalities that I show in this, in this slide. And so these are all different types of congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract. So I think when we think about the term kakut, it's imprecise, unfortunately. It's imprecise because we don't really understand why one patient gets a small kidney, another patient gets valves, another person gets vascoureteric ure reflux. So if we look at these images, and, and I would say most of these diagnoses are really made through uh, either ultrasound, plus or minus avoiding cystic urethrogram, plus or minus a nuclear medicine scan. So the diagnoses include renal hypoplasia. Here shown a very small kidney on one side, a normal on the other one. And on ultrasound, you would see a small kidney with a hypercoic cortex uh, parenchyma compared to the adjacent liver here. Uh, you can have a multicystic dysplastic kidney, which again is a abnormal kidney filled with cysts. It's non-rediform or irregular in shape. And typically between these cysts, the intervening parenchyma is, is dysplastic or malformed. It looks hypercoic as shown in this little patch here. Uh, the differential of a multicystic dysplastic kidney, sometimes it can actually look very similar to a pelvic ureteric junction obstruction. And the key the key trick for the ultrasonographer is to determine whether these cysts are communicating or not, because if they're communicating, then you would think maybe you have a, a, a pelvis, a renal pelvis, that's actually communicating with dilated calyces as shown here. So that's the major differential for a multicystic dysplastic is, is pelvic ureteric junction obstruction. So here we have a unilateral multicystic dysplastic kidney. The bilateral uh, type does arise, is super rare, and, and leads to a Potter's uh, 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 syndrome uh, at birth because of the oligohydramnios, because these kidneys don't produce urine. Uh, well, we also have urinary tract duplications, as shown here. And so here in this cartoon, I'm showing you two full ureters uh, inserting into the bladder. And uh, here in this image is the upper pole ureter that's dilated. And that's shown on the ultrasound here of the kidney where this is the upper pole, where you see big dilation of the pelvis extending into the calyces, whereas the lower pole, pole looks preserved. And you know, there are different varieties of this. But I think once you have a duplication and you have dilation, you have to ask yourself, is this is the dilated pole either refluxing or is it obstructed? So that always requires further, further imaging. Then we have vesicle ureteric reflux where there's a defect at the ureterovesical junction and urine is going back retrogradely to both kidneys and that's diagnosed through avoiding cystourethrogram. So here's a patient that we treated with a massive bladder and you see that the contrast is going up these very dilated ureters all the way up into the calyces bilaterally. So this is really severe grade five reflux. And every time this, this, this child voids, uh, more than half of that urine is going up to the kidneys. And so this is the kind of plumbing problem that clearly leads to infection. We talked a bit about the pelvic ureteric junction obstruction here, a dilated pelvis extending to the calyces on ultrasound. And then finally, we talked about posterior urethral valves. So very different morphologically, but they all have this diagnosis of kakut. Um, so what do we know about the embryonic events that lead to it? So if we look at this cartoon, um, I want you to take away from this that this is the developing kidney urinary tract going through stages to form the final kidney and the final ureter. So this, this x-axis shows time in weeks. And so what's important for you to know is that at week four of human gestation, kidney development is underway. And it's going on from week four 
like the major morphogenic events are going on from week four to week eight, but nephron formation is actually going on from about week six, week seven, all the way to week 36. So there's an iterative process that goes on and on. So if we just look at these stages at week four, you see that there's embryonic urinary tract shown here with three serial kidneys, a pronephro shown up here, a mesonephric kidney shown here, and then the final metanephric kidney, the one that ends up looking like this, is down at the very caudal end of the embryo near the hind limb. And so these serial kidneys form and disappear. And the serial kidneys is just curious because the nephrons are really lined up in a linear uh, configuration. And the other issue I want to bring to your attention is that this tissue, the primordial tissue that gives rise to both the future kidney and the urinary tract, is, is also giving rise to the future gonads. So we always need to be cognizant of the fact that um, in patients with Kakut, there may be associated sex duct defects or uterine defects, and that needs to be considered. So the kidney uh, is forming down here. This structure we call the ureteric bud grows into the this uh, mass of mesenchyme, and there's reciprocal signaling between the two tissues. And what happens is this ureteric bud, one end of it induces the kidney and the other end elongates to form the ureter. So through a very uh, series of elegant steps, the ureter separates from this duct, which you'll see in the literature called the Wolfian, the mesonephric, the nephric duct, it's all the same duct. The ureter separ separates from this duct so that the ureter eventually has its own independent insertion into the future bladder. And the mesonephric duct is shown here. And in females, that duct disintegrates. In males, it gives rise to the, the male genital tract, the epididymis uh, vas deferens. So this ureteric bud is pretty important structure. It has to signal to the mesenchyme and the ureteric bud undergoes branching events. And those branching events, wherever the ureteric bud branches at its tip is where a future nephron will form, which is sort of shown in the, in the cartoon here. So the pattern of the branching is critical to where the nephrons form and how many nephrons form. So I think that needs to be underlined that this process is going on over and over again from about week six to week 36 of gestation, and then you're done. So at the top of the cartoon, I just showed you when some of these defects are occurring. So kidney agenesis, where you never make a kidney, is an early defect because you never make a ureteric bud. In contrast, kidney hypoplasia, you might make a few nephrons, so you manage to get to this stage, but there may be reduced branching or you may get fewer nephrons. Ectopic horseshoe kidney occurs a little bit later, reflux a little bit later, because you need to have a ureter that's actually separated and um, inserting uh, incorrectly into the bladder. Nephron number is a defect that is occurring anytime between week six to 36. We're gonna talk about that within the spectrum of Kakut. And then we have kidney dysplasia, which is later, and then valves, which is really talking about how this urethra forms, which is developing out of the primordial bladder. Okay, so um, nephrogenesis is occurring, as I said, as an iterative process. So here I'm just drawing a blow up of the ureteric bud invading the mesenchyme shown here. And on the ventral side of the ureteric bud, we start to see some of this mesenchyme, which is spread here, starting to go through an event called epithelialization. And that epithelialization is how we begin to form a nephron. So here at this next stage of epithelialization of this mesenchyme, you have a lumen shown here. And then this, this extends to form an S-shaped body and eventually it's starting to look like a full nephron that we know. And so this process occurs over and over again at every ureteric bud tip as shown here. So at week 15 of human gestation, there are already as many as 15,000 nephrons per kidney. And the final nephron number at week 36 of human gestation is very variable. Uh, it varies from as low as 200,000 nephrons to as high as 2 million nephrons. And that's in quote unquote normal people, okay? This is not talking about people with Kakut who probably have fewer than 200,000 or no nephrons if they never made a kidney. But I want you to be aware of this because nephron number is a quantitative trait like height, like eye color, like hair color, et cetera. And so the factors that, that uh, uh, enhance or diminish nephron number are super important to capture as we try to understand chronic kidney disease across the lifespan. 
And so, as all of you know, treating kids, uh, the experience in utero is critical to the health of that of that uh, baby that's delivered. And crudely, we sum up the experience of gestation with the birth weight. Now, clearly, birth weight can be, you know, so so we would say that uh, in general, you want to have. A, a normal birth weight, you don't want to be excessive or macrosomic as we see in diabetic pregnancies, but you also don't want to be low birth weight. And so what we're showing in this in this particular cartoon is taken from a paper by Houston. On the y-axis, we're showing a number of glomeruli as a surrogate for nephro number. And on the x-axis, we're correlating this with uh, birth weight. So these were uh, infants that died for other reasons, and they tracked their birth weight with nephron number that was done on autopsy studies. And so from this, you can see there appears to be a, a somewhat of a correlation between birth weight and nephron number. And indeed, that's what the author said. They said that there is approximately a 250,000 increase in nephron number per one kilogram increase in birth weight. So clearly what's happening in that maternal environment in utero is critical to what's going to, how many nephrons you're going to make. And that same process is critical to the events of Kakut. This is shown in another example, another paper by Manalik, where again, they're using number of glomeruli on the y-axis for nephron number. And here they're showing another example of birth weight. Here they show that if your birth weight was less than 2.5 kilograms, this was associated with much, with many fewer nephrons. So these are some things you can kind of hold on to in terms of when you're taking histories, et cetera, you know, what was the birth weight of the infant? And then more recently, um, in this paper, uh, these authors looked at prematurity, less than 37 weeks. They looked for, at babies who were small for gestational age and low birth weight. And what you can see from this is that if you go from uh, the y-axis here is showing the cumulative incidence in CKD, and the x-axis is just demonstrating the, the lines showing if you have no risk factors, meaning you're not premature, you're not small for gestational age, you're not low birth weight, and then how it goes up your incidence of chronic kidney disease so that if you have more than three factors, you're up in this very, this highest uh, dotted line here showing the higher incidence of CKD. So I think when you're taking your histories and thinking about it, those are things to factor in because obviously you're not going to capture low nephron number from any imaging studies at present. And this I just want to take for you. This is adapted from uh, Julie Inglefinger's uh, promotion uh, or publicity, making us all aware of World Kidney Day many years ago. But uh, you can basically think of this period fetal life and pregnancy, nephrogenesis ceases here. And that's all the only number of nephrons you're ever going to make. It's done. And then as we age, we're slowly losing nephrons as we age. And so, uh, in fact, there's estimates as well that nephron loss may be in a natural, in, in the natural, with natural aging, approximately 4,500 nephrons are lost per kidney per year. So when you start to look at numbers like that, you can really see that, you know, if you had your, if you could, you'd much rather be in that group of individuals who are born with 2 million nephrons per kidney rather than 200,000 because we're clearly losing them with normal aging. So we're losing our nephrons as we age. And then if you're already starting with low nephron number, some type of caput, and then you're hit with another acquired kidney disease, that could be diabetes, that could be you're obese. That could be you have high blood pressure or high blood pressure could arise from having low nephrons or having caput. All of those things are going to uh, accelerate the rate of decline in your loss of kidney function. So I think thinking about the patient holistic like, holistically like that is very important. And I think it's important for all of us to be counseling our patients because once these kids are born with caput, other than correcting their kidney, their urinary tract problems, potentially with surgical intervention, there's not much we can do at this point. And you can see even like in the age of gene therapy, how would you ever do gene therapy in this when we're starting to make nephrons at week six of gestation? Like how would you rescue it? So you can see that it's a lot about prevention of, of trying to decrease this rate of loss of, through natural aging. So the other problem with Kakut is it's phenotypically variable. And so I wanted just to show you this family tree that was taken from a paper by Santa Church. He's showing you that um, all of the people who are in dark black have some type of Kakut phenotype. And so if you look at this, you would say, wow, this looks like it might be dominantly inherited because it's affecting girls and boys and it's in every generation. Um, 
And but then it gets more complicated because when you start to look at their phenotypes, this really just you know gives you the 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 real uh, clear clear uh, signal that Kakut is phenotypically heterogeneous. So patient three here had a single kidney. Patient seven um, over here has. Uh, renal dysplasia and a PUJ obstruction. Patient 18 has renal dysplasia, and these guys are twins, and patient 19 has dis renal dysplasia and reflux. So this is par for the course. When you're when you try to take a family history, this is what you'll find. And clearly, if this patient didn't have an ultrasound or any workup, you may not even know they have a single kidney. So you may not know within the extended family of your case uh, what the family, what what kind of pathologies are there in terms of cut. So what do we know about why cacut occurs? Well, it is a combination of genetic and environmental factors. Um, there are some monogenic disorders that do explain some cases of cacut, but currently I would say that probably might account for 15 to 20% of all cases of cacut. So that means there's a huge number that we don't have clear monogenic inheritance for. Um, for those monogenic disorders, we definitely do know that there are heterozygous dominant gene mutations in two transcription factors that seem to come up frequently. One is in HNF1 beta, and the second one is in PAX2. And those two genes may explain 15% of all cases of CACUT, both syndromic and non-syndromic. So again, when you are finding a kid with CACUT, you need to be thinking broadly, what else went wrong? What other organs should I screen for? And so we need to be thinking about extra renal disease. So when we think about extra renal disease, we're thinking about defects like optic colobomas, which are associated with rare mutations in PAX2. We need to think about um, uh, ear defects, like branchial cleft defects. So preauricular pits, um, clefts along the branchial arches are all associated with, again, a rare syndrome, branchial syndrome. Um, we need to think about pancreatic defects. So mutations in HNF1 beta are associated with maturity onset diabetes of the young. Now, typically that doesn't arise till out of the childhood years. So mostly that's happening in the early sort of twenties, but clearly if you have a child who's obese, these types of phenotypes might manifest earlier. So just to put those two together, um, again, with HNF1 beta, it has been associated with autism. And then you need to think about genital tract defects, as I said before, knowing the embryology of the kidney and urinary tract and that that, that primordial mesenchyme that gives rise to the kidneys also gives rise to the, the gonads. So these defects may not become apparent till later in life, particularly in females. Um, they may fail to go through menarche if they have a bicornuate uterus with, with um, blockage of the uh, cervix, there's vaginal atresia, and then in boys, undescended testes. So if you have a missing kidney on one side, is the testes descended on that side or not? Um, look, and then later in life, there may be fertility defects, difficulty with ejaculation, which we'll come back to. And this slide is just to give you a, a screenshot of some of the genes that are involved and some of the syndromic types of cacut, which are really quite really quite rare. Um, but I would just highlight that some of these genes like HNF1 beta and PAX2 are also associated in non-syndromic cacut. So both in this, so if you have a syndrome, we definitely you know, should probably look for a gene mutation. If you don't have a syndrome, they still could be implicated. And then of course, copy number variants, which are just extra pieces of DNA uh, that are, that are um, smaller than having like an extra chromosome as in Down syndrome or, or having a loss, uh, a big deletion. Those are types of things you can see from karyotypes, but the copy number variants are smaller in size and can be in extra DNA or loss of DNA. And of course, all of the trisomies are high risk factors for cut So Down syndrome, trisomy 13, trisomy 18, et cetera. So what about the environment? Total black box and very important um, because firstly, you know, 50% of all pregnancies are unplanned. And that's a, a North American figure that I'm quoting there. So what it means is most women are becoming pregnant and they've missed their first period and they had no idea they were, they weren't trying to become pregnant and they weren't taking any precautions in terms of environmental exposures. And we know from a review of the literature that both folic acid use and deficiency can be associated with PECA, um, shown here in the, in the uh, slide. Vitamin A deficiency is, a, is another important cause of cut. 
Um, and then important causes of kakut that are emerging are maternal obesity and maternal diabetes. So when you have these risk factors in pregnancy, you must be considering whether the, whether the uh, developing fetus will be affected. Maternal malnutrition is important. And then substance abuse, cocaine, alcohol, and then for drugs, clearly ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers are risk factors for kakut. And then in vitro fertilization, which is becoming more and more uh, popular for families that can't that are that can't have a have a baby, and that as well as a risk factor for kakut. So let's go back to our case. So if you recall, we started with that boy presented in, uh, at birth or at three weeks of age with a urinary tract infection. We diagnosed posterior urethral valves. And so now let's go back to see what's happening to him now. So if you follow his growth curve, so here's his uh, height and here's his weight, you see that he starts to flatten out a little bit here and a decreased growth rate here. And so um, again, in a North American context, um, I've got the units in both, but his serum creatinine continues to rise. So his serum creatinine is now 75 micromoles per liter or 0.85, which gives him an estimated GFR by Schwartz of about 58. So he's clearly got chronic kidney disease. And at that level, if you're below 75 in North America, you are actually eligible for growth hormone injection to try to accelerate your growth because we know with chronic kidney disease, you are uh, growth hormone resistant or you're, um, yeah, you're, 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 you need often need growth hormone to, uh, you are growth hormone resistant, but you treat it by giving growth hormone injections. So we started growth hormone at this point, and we did see some improvement in, in uh, height velocity. And at that point as well, what we noticed is this boy had a mild distal renal tubular acidosis. But we started with some sodium bicarbonate supplementation to treat his persistent, uh, to, to treat the mild RTA, which is probably related to his hydronephrosis. Um, and so we also noticed, you know, a year a year after that, this is age nine, that he started, he was having very high urine output, which isn't uncommon in Kakut because these kidneys are dysplastic. And he was sometimes having urinary accidents and frequent stool staining of his underwear. Um, so he saw the urologist and they did some Euroflow studies. And what you see classically with valves is this prolonged um, prolonged phase of urination shown here. So he had a decreased maximum flow with a prolonged flow time um, and significant post-void residual. And so the treatment as described again in our, our previous talk is, you know, you can, you can add uh, stool bulking agents to try to improve bladder emptying. And then for him, we, we initially started with prescribing double voiding, but some of the kids with bad posterior valve bladders will even go as far as to needing either catheterizations or bladder augments, depending on how their bladder uh, adapts over time. So just going on here, so we'll skip, we'll fast forward. Now this boy is 17 and he's ready. This boy with posterior valves, he's ready for transfer to an adult treating team. His GFR is dropped. He's now at 25 mils per minute. So he's approaching um, you know, his chronic kidney disease stage four. Um, and he comes to you in his office, in your office, and he's asking you all these questions about himself. And these are many things that I would argue as pedi pediatricians, pediatric nephrologists, we don't talk about when we're talking to kids and they're important to, to discuss. And I would argue as well, the long-term literature on this is pretty sparse. And so for people who are looking for research projects, I think this is a whole area that's emerging in terms of long-term outcome of Kakut. So these are some of the questions he comes to you as he's got a girlfriend, he's wondering, can he have normal sexual activities? Uh, he wonders if he needs to worry about his own fertility his ability to father children. Can he transmit his cacut defect to his children? Will he need a new kidney? Will his bladder fail later in life? Will he need diapers? So all really good questions and important for important for him to give the best answers possible. So fortunately, most most men with posterior valves will be able to have erections and orgasms, but renal failure, as you know, definitely does impair libido. And fertility may be impaired in patients with valves because the bladder neck may continue to be open post fulguration or ablation of the valves, leading to retrograde ejaculations. They may also get weaker propulsion of sperm into the urethra, leading to slow or dry ejaculation. So there is a risk for that, but they should be able to have normal sexual activities, but fertility may be impaired. Um, he also wonders, can he transmit his caca defect to his children? 
So the incidence we say at Packard overall is about 1% of all pregnancies. Um, this is in the setting of no clear monogenic inheritance. Um, so we would say that in this case where we did not identify, you know, a gene and we didn't have a, uh, a dramatic family history for Kakut, we would say that knowing that he's affected, he probably has an increased risk of fathering a child with Kakut in the future, and it would be more complex inheritance. So we would say his risk is probably two to three percent. And so, uh, the, the important things, I guess, to also inform him of are, you know, when he goes to have a baby, that it would be ideal if there was not, a, it wasn't by in vitro fertilization because there's epigenetic changes that occur in that route. And also, you know, if his partner did not have diabetes, that would be advantageous for avoiding Kekut. Um, and obviously, if his partner wasn't obese, though we know those are two risk factors for Kekut. And then he asked, when, when am I going to need a new kidney? And I think these are really important questions that, again, I don't think have been fully answered in the literature. And so if I go to my next slide, I want to just sensitize you to this, this beautiful study done by Wool et al. It's a German study, and they looked at people starting renal failure for any reason across the lifespan. And so in the black boxes, you see people starting some type of dialysis therapy because of CACUT. And in the hatch boxes, it's anything but CACUT. And so I think this really shows us as pediatricians, pediatric nephrologists, how small our scope is of practice because we're hung up about all the patients that are in these boxes, right? But look at across the lifespan, CACUT is the number one cause of starting dialysis up until the mid forties. So most of our patients that will not, arrive, will not end up on dialysis during our, while they're with us, will definitely end up on dialysis as older adults. And I think we often forget this and the impact of it. And I would put the low nephron number group in here too, as a part of the phenotypic spectrum of Kakut within this. So I think this slide is important to think about because when we think about adult kidney failure, we say, oh, it's all diabetes, 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 and it's hypertension. But some of the, some of the hypertension could in fact be Kakut or low nephron number if it's occurring early in life. Um, and clearly Kakut is having a big impact across the lifespan. And this paper, the, this last paper I want to highlight for you in, was taken from, it's an American study um, done by McLeod et al. of the boys with posterior urethral valves. And it's a really nice uh, long-term output, out, um, long-term follow-up study. It's remarkably got 274 boys with posterior urethral valves. So it's like the largest study that I'm aware of that's been published. And so what they show, they followed these boys from age um, zero up into age 20. They clearly lost people over time because you can see they started with 274, but about five years of age, they had 147, 54, et cetera. So they didn't really have very many at all that fulfilled, you know, that they could follow to 20 years. But nonetheless, their numbers up until age 10 aren't so bad. And what you can see is on the y-axis is the proportion of, of children without renal replacement therapy. And what you can see is there's a slow, steady decline and loss of kidney function over time. Is that, that's what we're seeing. And so that by age 10, we already have maybe 30% of those kids have started some type of dialytic therapy. And then the graph on the right is even more interesting, in my opinion, because what they then did is they took all of their babies and they looked at their nadir serum creatinine. So what that means is they said, what's the lowest serum creatinine those children have in, during the first year of life? Let's subgroup all of the children shown in this curve into those groups. So they subgrouped them into um, serum creatinine less than 0.4 milligrams per deciliter between 0.4 to 0 0.6, 0 0.7 to 0.99, and then greater than one. And they said, okay, what's their uh, trajectory for needing renal replacement therapy? And what you can see is for the group that have a serum creatinine during the first year of life, if their lowest serum creatinine is 80 is one or 88 micromoles per liter, one, one milligram per deciliter, 100% of those kids ended up on dialysis before the age of 10. So that's quite useful for, I find, for us uh, prognosticating and for giving families information about their risk, their risk for renal failure and their need for kidney failure. And I would also argue this group, this group here are desperately in need of, of bladder counseling and bladder therapy to make sure that the bladder isn't causing more rapid decline in their kidney function. Okay. 
So in conclusion, um, I hope I've explained or expressed a few major concepts today. Hepcut represents a spectrum of kidney, urinary tract, and bladder defects. The etiology includes genetic factors like mutations in HNF1 beta and PAX2, but it also includes environmental factors which remain a big black box. Maternal diabetes and obesity are important risk factors that you need to be considering. And, and certainly mothers who are pregnant who are diabetic need good control of their blood sugar. That's super important. And Kekut is responsible for most cases of kidney failure from birth until age of 45 years, at least in a European database. And I wanna leave you with that idea that low nephron number is part of the spectrum of Kekut. So I thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take questions. And just on another note, um, you know, in terms of the environment, I would just argue that, you know, we also know that um, uh, heavy metal exposure is important for the environment. So for example, uh, arsenic contamination of water supply, which I know is uh, in many parts of the world, uh, a problem. Uh, you know, these are things that are also uh, important environmental risk factors. So thinking about all the environmental contributors that are that are also uh, contributing to packet low nephron number are important for the health of our children. And if anybody has ideas about that and they want to talk more about it or research about that, I'm really interested in the environment and how it impl impl is implicated in packet. So please reach out to me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Gupta, for that enlightening talk. Um, I have always found uh, this CACUT uh, very difficult with all those uh, new, new uh, genetic names. And uh, But then, uh, like half of a time, uh, you get confused, as you correctly pointed out, that uh, with, the, with the same sort of uh, mutation in, uh, in one child, you can have one manifestation and in another, something different. So very really confusing, but hopefully with all your effort, uh, uh, things will be clearer in uh, in future. Uh, Dr. Uh, Levani, should we go for questions now or? Uh, yes, sir. we can take up the Q and A, sir. Okay. So uh, we have got uh, quite a few questions. I will start with uh, Professor Gupta and uh, because it is now fresh in mind and uh, there was uh, one question about like uh, folic acid and uh, any risk of uh, CACUT. Uh, Professor Gupta, you are, yeah. Folic Sorry, acid I didn't, hear, I didn't hear the first part of the question and risk of uh, risk of CACUT, but what was the first part? Folic acid in mother, whether it gives a, a risk of CACUT. With folic acid? Yeah. Uh, I is also, there a risk uh, of yeah, is that, that the was question the... with folic acid? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so let me just be clear. Folic acid is super important to avoid spina bifida during pregnancy. And that is the number one reason why we ask and counsel pregnant mothers to take folic acid um, during pregnancy. So I'm not for a minute saying stop giving people, stop giving pregnant mothers folic acid. We, we can't say that. I'm just showing you the data that in some studies, folic acid may also be detrimental. So probably the dose of folic acid matters. Um, I would tell you that in North America, we've gone crazy about folic acid. So it's up, it's in the flower. So we add it now. It's a, It's added you know, it's hidden in flour. All flour supply is folic acid supplemented. But I would just sensitize you that some of these moms are probably potentially having excessive amounts of folic acid. And we don't know if that is actually healthy. <clears throat> I don't want to be quoted as saying I said no to folic acid because the there's overwhelming evidence that show it shows it definitely decreases the risk of spina bifida, which is um, such a terrible congenital defect. So I would not want to for a moment say no to folic acid, but I just want to, I'm just telling people that there is some question about what's the correct dose. And so some people, you know, they think folic acid is good. I'm going to take mega doses, maybe not. So that the dose should be carefully given, uh, obviously prescribed. Yeah, I think that, that was a, is a very important point because <clears throat> people sometimes do take away wrong message. 
message. Uh, there's this uh, question from Dr. Uh, Watfa. Uh, interesting one. Like, uh, there is a father with a PUV. Uh, what uh, genetic testing approach for offspring with PUV would you advise? Genetic testing for PUV? Yeah. Like, uh, father, ha father had a PUV and one of his uh, child also has a PUV. So, what about the other siblings? Would you be advising any genetic testing? For future pregnancies or currently? Future pregnancies? No, no. I wouldn't. What I would do, though, is I would carefully monitor future pregnancies. And I'd say, like, this is a loaded question. It's a great, it's an excellent question. Um, this is a loaded area because... Um, because what I didn't reveal when I was going through the genetics is that not only is, so Kakut is phenotypically heterogeneous, it's also genetically heterogeneous, and it's also, it shows the genes that have been implicated show incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity. What does that mean? It means that the other children could have the very same mutation as their father and be fine. So I would never ever at this point in our in what we know about the genetics, I would never want to counsel, um, you know, to use genetic testing for counseling during pregnancy because I think it can be very very uh, it can be very misleading. Um, you may have a normal pregnancy, but I would absolutely counsel for future pregnancies that there is uh, appropriate high risk antenatal imaging antenatal ultrasound imaging for that so that when that boy has his children that that his pregnancy has early uh antenatal ultrasound imaging performed and plus or minus depending on where you are there's even fetal MRIs that can be done to you know I wouldn't say that's routine fetal imaging but in 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 some cases it's helpful but a good antenatal ultrasound done at 20 weeks can be very helpful and then followed antenatally. But I don't think at this point I would be saying do genetic testing on, in, in everyone. We have to be very careful with that, that information, I would say. Yeah, uh, I mean, that is the potency of uh, opening the Pandora box. So uh, keeping this in mind, uh, and this is a, a hot question, like uh, when do you advise for uh, genetic? in Kakut? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So to be honest, I think it's still very much at a research level. I think that there are some diseases that are, I'm gonna put in the actionable list. Now, if you look at mutations in WT1, Williams tumor one, classically that's associated with Denny Drash syndrome, but there are some Kakut variants of that. And that is a gene I think you do want to diagnose because of its implications for that child developing Wilms tumor. But that's very, very unique. And it's a very carved off group of people that you're going to be worried about that. So, uh, you know, I think, I don't think genetic testing is ready quite yet, in my opinion, for prime time in Kakut. I think it needs to be done, but I don't think we understand all the implications of what we're finding yet because Kakut is phenotypically heterogeneous and it's genetically heterogeneous, meaning we don't have a lot of genotype, phenotype correlations that we can inform people with. So it's information, but it's information that I'm not sure it's helpful yet to the, for the patient. It's super interesting for all of us in our community to understand the biology and mechanism of disease, but I'm not sure what we're giving back to our patients' families yet. So uh, at the moment, uh, you are saying that uh, clinically, most of the time, there are uh, not my, many indications for doing the genetic. For the, okay. I would say the indicators are, in, in at least in the if we think about the fetal cases, the fetal cases would be severe poly, uh, severe oligohydramnios, where you may have uh, uh, big kidneys that look like an autosomal recessive PKD, which can mimic Kakut, right? So that would be a scenario where I would absolutely want to know, does this baby, does this fetus have um, a gene mutation for ARPKD? Because that, I think, is super important to know. 
So I only bring up ARPD. ARPD, I don't consider Kakut, but it certainly can recapitulate some phenotypes that look like Kakut. So it should be in your differential to nail that as a diagnosis. But then I would just go after that as your gene. And uh, and uh, post natally, for example, like uh, you uh, you have a dysplastic kidney, or uh, then would you go for genetics? Postnatally, yeah. Postnatally, no. So what I what I tend to do is, I tend to start with um, I would do a chromosomal microarray before I would do specific targeted genetic sequencing. Why? Because we know a lot more now about copy number variants and their association with different syndromes, and that can be helpful because. Um, some of the chromosomal abnormalities that are associated with Kakut are also associated with learning brain defects. And I think that's important to know early on to help those children. But I don't think, again, we're at a point where, where we're using that genetic information therapeutically. We're using it to, as adjuncts to give more comprehensive, holistic care for that child. Because we'll say, oh, we know you have a large deletion. We know you have a hot spot on this chromosome, we know it's associated with, with learning problems, different brain defects. This child needs to be targeted for special help if we if they can get that as a resource, <laughs> which is then the next question, which we all worry about. Yeah, definitely makes sense because uh, like using it for uh, uh, further counseling will be quite difficult. Because- And you're uh, consenting, and yeah, totally, totally. And you're consenting children. And that's a problem because the parents are always consenting for the children and the children may turn around at age 18 and say, why did you do this genetic testing on me? So we have to be thoughtful and have, you know, balance the risks and benefits of, of what, why we're like doing a, it is, how is it helpful? I think it is really heterogeneous because uh, uh, the Pax2 mutation has even been implicated with FSDS. Yes, but those so, cases, those cases, I would argue, Maybe it's it is a secondary. It's a low number FSGS. No, but but then uh, I have a child who has a nephrotic range proteinuria, and, and we had a Pax2 mutation, which was uh, said to be a, a likely pathogenic. Anyway, this is very confusing. We will now move on to something more uh, clinical with uh, Dr. Uh, Kanitkar, ma'am. Uh, uh, this is a, a common question, like uh, post PUV, how do you? follow up a child and uh, and and how long like like what frequency and and when do you start when do you advise or do you ever advise a, a, a urodynamic at what age so uh, there's a couple of questions on that if you can take that i think that's a, a very good question firstly since i'm coming i must uh, really uh, thank uh, indra for uh, excellent this thing which and it gels so much started at this time. I'm sure people would really understand the embryogenesis and how kidney is really being affected with bladder, ureters, etc. Uh, and this thing is very important because uh, following valves, especially in the Indian uh, context, once it's fulgurated, most children are lost to follow up because the fulguration is done by the surgeons and they may not come back and they generally come back uh, much later. And the way, uh, uh, you know, very nice case that Indra described, where they generally come for growth failure. And in the Indian context, before growth hormone, there are so many other things happening. There's nutrition, which is because there's a low grade, some uremia. There's acidosis, which is often missed. In fact, kids have come to me where they've become with an asthma because of the increased acidosis and you find that uh, you need to handle that. And the polyuria and the wetting is just taken for granted. So the tubular defects are very, very uh, early and they don't happen. So when, what should you do? What we recommend is at least a baby who's being fulgurated to follow up serially if, like you do your annual checkups. I think it is important to look at growth but also follow up, follow up uh, with post-void residues and ultrasounds. Because if you do find increased post-void residues, those are probably the first telltale signs or a child coming with urinary tract infections. Because 
the dribbling of continence may not be coming to light till the child achieves continence. But a post-void residue or a dilating tract, so at least a yearly ultrasound followed up in that sequence. And if we find urinary tract infections, then you definitely do an ultrasound and look at post-void residue and dilated upper tracts. So these probably are the earliest. And then monitor the child for three things. One is UTIs, growth of the child, growth of the kidney. If you find this is also faulty, those would be very probably early signs. And then avoiding diary comes in very handy because you may pick up polyuria very early. And since it's a retrograde effect, it always starts with the collecting tubules being affected first. So the polyuria comes in earlier. The acidosis comes in later and then the real glomerular dysfunction. So very often in Indian scenario, you'll find valve children coming with dribbling, already having early rickets because of acidosis. And the, these are the problems. So I think following them up with at least uh, 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 an ultrasound and looking out for urinary tract infections and looking at the urinary stream. So these three things I think would be very clinical very easy to monitor. If we find that the post-void residues are large, then it is better to do a urodynamic and look at pressure volume curves before it starts popping off at the kidney. So then I would really look at uh, uroflows and urodynamics. So uh, on this, there's this question, like uh, how would you assess a post-void residue in a baby who hasn't, like uh, who is in uh, toilet trend now? Even if baby is not toilet trained, I mean, if once the baby uses, and most of these babies, in fact, it's even easier. Because if you find, like, if it's a young child, you put a jelly and, you know, a probe on the suprapubic region, and the child normally would void out. So, right there itself, you would be able to immediately assess a post void recipe. So, I think that would be an uh, easier sign. But if you're really worried, if you're really worried, you might even do a clean catheterization just to bring out to see how much urine got left behind. And, and uh, when do you do the UDS? I, like I said, the UDS, I wouldn't go in immediately at the moment the child is fulgurated. But if I do see that there is post-void residues or the boy is coming back with urinary tract infections or dribbling, then I would do a UTS early rather than late because post void, the bladders do have a different morphology and we don't know how long and how severe the volume. So I would really want to know the volume and pressure dynamics in this bladder. And we might need to follow it up with serial uh, systometries at least, if not UTS, to look at this changing pattern because as the child is growing, the bladder dynamics is also changing. So uh, you don't advise uh, uh, UTS in, in all, uh, all uh, post puberty. See, when you advise, you would have to then say it's a mandatory that every fulgurated child should have a UTS. I won't be able to uh, give an offhand statistics as to number of invasive urodynamics you would need to do. But personally, in a... Uh, resource limited situation and the availability of people who can really do good urodynamics in children. In India, I would say monitor clinically closely, look at non-invasive urodynamics, but at the first sign of that something is not really working out, I'm going for a urodynamics. Professor Gupta, if your practice, is it the same or, or, or in, uh, in Montreal where hopefully you have got everything? Uh, do you practice something else? No, we practice very similar to what Dr. Kanekar has outlined. Uh, we follow them closely. We tend to, um, once they're over five, we tend to do a yearly Euroflow post void residual, not full UDS, uh, just once for the same reason. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, once, once they're over five years. Yeah. Yeah. Because under five years, as she pointed out in her, her, beautiful lecture it's uh you know they're not that's an, a quote unquote an immature bladder so uh 
you know, really, you know, when you're going to define someone as having pathological emptying or, or pathological bladder function, it's really classically over five years of age. That's usually when we start doing those tests. So, uh, be, uh, like, uh, you don't you know, do this? Just interrupt, Raji. I just interrupt one uh, very simple tip. I mean, we've now developed even nomograms of four hourly urine voids in even newborns. Yeah, that's so, what I, I was going to Yeah, ask. I, exactly. So, I mean, we could look at that. We don't need to do, uh, you know, even in the steps we observe, we watch, we look at four hourly voids. And you could find a roughly, as you know, get a, some idea from that as to what is the bladder capacity. So, that would help us pick up early. The importance is being aware of it, being knowing what you can do. And knowing that you need to follow up these children. So like, uh, Professor Gupta, do you do this uh, regularly, this uh, four-hourly observation? In uh, Like, it is supposed to be quite useful in infant. In the, we don't. We don't. Um, we would go more on whether they're getting recurrent infections. Then we would sort of focus on that group in a different way. Um, but no, in general, no, we haven't done that. I mean, I think uh, one of the challenges, as Dr. Kanekar outlined, is you really need the parents on board because even to do the voiding diary, they really need to invest and complete it. And I can tell you, we have families that they feel like they're too busy, especially when the child is at school age, right? And then you have no idea what's going on, but they're upset about the behavior, but they might not be willing to invest or they're working, whatever. So, yeah. So uh, there are a few more questions, uh, Dr. Kanekar uh, and uh, Professor Gupta, if you can just uh, answer them online also, like some simple like role of time solution in, in post-void residue and role of anticholinergic. Dr. Kalamani, do we have time to take it up or it, it, uh, will it be better for them to answer them? Like type the answers. Verbally, verbally answering is much easier. And uh, Okay, we have yeah. time. Okay. Indra ma'am and Kanikar ma'am is fine with it. We can just have the discussion for a few more minutes and close. Okay. So uh, then there's this uh, question about role of uh, time solution in large post void. Residue. I'm not too sure about, I have no experience. They're mostly used for, uh, you know, adults with prostates and those kind of obstructions, which I saw, we've never really, uh, I've never used in children. Uh, uh, we, are, we have been using them and uh, like it is supposed to be this alpha thing and it yeah. uh, relaxes the the sphincter. So, yes, you can, but then it should be done by someone who is who has uh, who is using it quite frequently. Yeah. Uh, role of anticholinergics in neurogenic bladder. Even in neurogenic bladders, you might want to do it to sort of give a functional increase in a very relaxed bladder because even neurogenic bladders do tend to be overactive. So uh, that would be a uh, closely used uh, the same. But one word of caution while using anticholinergics, they worsen constipation. So uh, if you're dealing with a uh, abnormal bladder and we are all repeatedly harping treat constipation, if I'm starting an anticholinergic, I'd explain that and be a little more careful that they have adequate fluids and are not constipated. And, uh, and I think uh, in the neurogenic bladder, if uh, CIC is also very important. Like you should have a low in threshold of uh, starting CIC. That can be kidney safe. Yeah, I, I have not really covered the neurogenic. Neurogenic, hmm. the indications are very clear to do urodynamics yeah. early, to do annual urodynamics because with the tethered cord or, you know, the cord, the child growing, the kind of manifestation of the neurogenic bladder changes. It's a very dynamic bladder. So you need to do it more frequently. We are we today were talking mostly the functional voiding disorders. Yes. And uh, another question on how long will you give and how do you taper DDAVP? Most probably in the aneurysis. Desmopressin is used in very specific conditions. I mean, I wouldn't start a child with desmopressin, but if I find a child has nocturnal polyuria, I would probably use that. If I need to use it for specific, this thing where aneurysis is a problem and it's an adolescent girl who's, you know, attained menarche during her periods, it could be when the child is staying out. But also in situations of aneurysis with daytime symptoms, 
if it could be an adjunct to behavioral therapy or if I find an overactive bladder, an adjunct to the anticholinergic. Uh, so when I want to use a double listing, where I want to relax the bladder, but also reduce the amount of urine that is produced so that the child doesn't have to keep waking up or going to the toilet. So then I would use that. But again, so, uh, that, I'd be very careful because, you know, we don't want dilutional hyponatremia. So giving it only before bedtime, I wouldn't do it the whole day. So last couple of questions is for Dr. Indra Gupta. One is about the upthum, uh, um, eye examination in CACUT. Like, uh, what is the importance? Yeah, and... so we don't, we don't know the answer to that. Um, certainly, there are, uh, in some of the genetic studies in non-syndromic CACUT with a good ophthalmologic exam, they were able to pick up some subclinical ocular defects, so retinal colobomas, et cetera. So I think that uh, we don't know the answer in terms of saying every child with CACUT should have eye screening. I think we don't know that. Any child with syndromic CACUT, yes, should have eye screening for sure. So if you already have identified some type of syndromic part to the CACUT, yes, I would definitely recommend it. But for children who look normal but have one CACUT defect in I don't know the answer to that from a resource a cost perspective. I don't know. And it's a good uh, question. And then the last question is from me. Uh, like, uh, and either you or uh, Madam Karinska can take it up. Uh, it's like in a in a child with PUV, but and having nocturnal polyuria. Uh, so, like, we have quite frequent these sort of cases. Uh, a mild uh, bilateral hydronephroneutrosis and uh, we are following this child. Creatinine is stable, not right. Significant polyuria. Uh, how would you manage these children? Like uh, for, for significant nocturnal polyuria, do you go for a, a nocturnal uh, like uh, catheterization? So uh, this, I, I think this is important. We first have to know that this nocturnal polyuria is because of a dilutional defect. I mean, it's a tubular dysfunction and then it's the collecting tubules and therefore this always starts off with a nocturnal problem. And there's a, as we know, the desmopressin it works through your aquaporine channels. And these channels become sort of, you know, uh, defective. They don't work as well. And that is why the child is having nocturnal polyuria. What is important is if it's a safe uh, polyuria, that means it's not disturbing the child's sleep as much and uh, sort of not bedwetting, he's passing it out. So the back pressure changes won't be much. But if this polyuria is associated with back pressure changes as well, then and, and you're already seeing dilating tracts, then we would ensure evacuation and if it's with large post void residues, you may even need a overnight drainage or frequent, uh, uh, you know, waking up. Because a small child is, if he has to keep waking up four or five times a night, he's going to have daytime sleepiness and not be able to attend school. So we might need to, you at least uh, younger children, let them be in diapers so that they sleep through it. Because at that point, that is important. But that child, I would watch very, very closely. Because you've already started seeing tubular defects. Next thing you're going to get is early acidosis, a vitamin D, uh, uh, you know, problems, rickets. So this child is your uh, uh, creatinines may not rise. He may keep doing well. But he's already having back pressure changes. So I'd relieve those pressures. I'd use anticholinergics, let the bladder capacity. If the bladder capacity is small, we might think of an augmentation. So that it relieves the pressures and the back pressures are not affected. So I would agree with that. I would just add, I think most of those kids, I think what's important to know is most kids with posterior valves do get to toilet trained. Like they do become continent. So I think what's more important is what's happening during the day. So I would, if it's isolated nocturnal polyuria, I would wonder if this is more still, you know, they have a component of that CNS brain disturbance in terms of how they're communicating. I would wonder about that so that, you know, as they age and as they grow up, maybe that will improve, but because most of them are, are continent. 
So I think we have covered most of the questions. Uh, Dr. Suprita has mentioned about desmopressin uh, being to used uh, with the caution, like, uh, and uh, I think all of us here do agree that uh, it's not something that uh, we just uh, write off the pen. I think Dr. Namalva sir wanted to tell something. I have a small question to Dr. Rajiv Sinha. Uh, what is the mechanism pathogenesis of nocturnal uh, polyuria and post uterine valve? How is that they are all right in the morning and how do they become polyuric in the night? I don't think, I think it's a combination of things. I think it's, I don't think it's that they're, I think it's when they drink. And I think some of them, like their, their, their volume intake may, like they're, they've got a dysplastic kidney. So as Dr. Kanekar said, they have tubular dysfunction. They've got high urine output. And it's all about the timing of when they're voiding and when they're eating, right? And when when do they eat before they go to bed? When do they drink before they go to bed? And I think the the nighttime part is that they're part of the spectrum of um, uh, functional voiding disorders that haven't haven't yet kids who haven't yet um, succeeded in having uh, good CNS bladder communication, right? So there's a the there's a most kids would learn to be dry at night by maybe age seven, age eight. But even if you pull a class of, you know, kids that age, you're probably gonna, you know, in a class, maybe one in 30 will still be wetting the bed at night, normally, quote unquote, normally, right? And so often I get, I ask for a family history of deep sleeping and family history of who else had nocturnal aneurysis, even in those kids who have valves, just to try to sort it out. Because I would say the kids with valves, their problem isn't just polyuria usually isolated at night, unless it's the distribution of liquid over the day. It's usually, this is happening, you know, their their problem is all day. And the, the other association that we have seen is that, uh, say, that during day, these children uh, do go to the uh, void frequently, but at night, uh, when they are sleeping, they are not voiding frequently. So in the morning, we, like we do a bladder diary in our bladder clinic regularly. So we often see, see that uh, in the early morning, 600 ml of urine. And uh, we feel that it may be that during the, the daytime, they have been voiding quite frequently. So the, the total volume is the, is the same. It, it's not that in the night they are producing a lot of urine. It is only that at the night they are not voiding. And, right. uh, and uh, then, uh, as Dr. Kanitkar said, that if you're worried about uh, uh, upper tract dilatation, then uh, either uh, we sometimes ask them to uh, wake up at night and, and uh, maybe do one more void, which is often quite difficult on children, uh, or we can think of a CIC or something like that. Uh, that's why, Rajiv, what you see, we define nocturnal polyuria as very specifically that it's expected bladder capacity 130 yeah. Right. So if you're using that definition, then we say, is there actually volume? And if the volume is, we know that the nighttime is two things which change. One is your circadian rhythm of your antidiuretic hormone. And the second is an abnormal sodium handling. Because of that, these are the two main uh, sort of uh, pathogenesis where you might have a solute uh, you know, the diuresis, which increases the volume, or you have a defective antidiuretic hormone like uh, Indra said about a central listing problem or that because of the tubular defects you're it's there's insensitivity <clears throat> to this thing because nocturnal reduced volume is a, uh, a function of your antidiuretic hormone. Uh, Dr. Clemeny if you have if you give me time one more last question uh, this was uh, this is uh, we have got uh, frequently children coming with the increased frequency of uh, micturation, like the uh, increased frequency sometimes maybe even 15 times, 20 times. How do you differentiate between polacuria and something which is pathological? Because we have been told that polacuria is, uh, is like it, you don't have to really treat it. It uh, gets well by, by time. So what is your approach, Dr. Kanitkar, for this increased I frequency? See, what is pathological will happen day and night. So there would be nighttime also. Would also continue even if you try to distract. Polacuria, you typically find that, you know, the children is engrossed in play, watching TV. They're not really going. But at other times, they're rushing very, very uh, frequently to the bathroom. And it starts very suddenly. It's hmm. not something which is going on for some time. 
Yeah. Whereas uh, uh, when they have actual uh, a bladder problem or a dysfunctional voiding, it carries on for a while. Polacuria very often follows some respiratory infection, some kind of a thing. And there are uh, theories where that you may have a little viral uh, cystitis which you missed, and the child has you know followed that up with that. I mean, this is has been a very practical uh, thing that I have followed. But I'd love to listen to uh, any other inputs, you know. Besides, and yes. and the and the other thing is like like often the general pediatricians do start them on uh, oxybutyn. Uh, I mean, there are studies which have shown that uh, uh, polacuria, which is very cumbersome, which is very irritant, you may give for a short while and just help tide over, and then wean off quickly. Not more Professor than about. Uh, you all take on it. I think. Often that is um, constipation, often. Yeah, yeah. that I 100% agree. I think, and so I would be concerned about starting oxybutynin in, in those patients because I think it's often constipation or it's overflow from constipation. So the parents say, oh, no, no, they're going, they're going, but it's not. It's, they're still constipated. So my, you know, my my approach is first really convince yourself you've ruled out constipation. You know, maybe that'll include an X-ray of the abdomen because you can't get the history and you can't get the buy-in from the family that your their child is constipated. But I would say usually that's constipation till proven otherwise. That is our approach also in our blood abdomen. So thank you, uh, Doctor. I have a small thing. Uh, yeah. I have a small thing. Sir, okay. sir. As far as the frequency of urination in children, the two questions we generally ask is the, is the night disturbed, night sleep disturbed. If they say no, it's very unlikely to be a pathogenic cause. The next thing is there are no symptoms of dysuria, stranguria, then unlikely to be pathogenic. So that's a simple way of eliminating between the pathogenic uh, polyuria and the thing. The second question is, I mean, uh, I think the message we should leave strongly to Bible experts like you is that uh, uh, genetic testing for Kaikot syndrome is not warranted in practice. In fact, I had a boy, a child, where the three children and two children had posterior uterine bladder. So I, I requested the, the our genetic department to do it. They said, sir, don't ask them to waste their money. This is not going to help them in any way. So in practice, genetic test is not a, a part of our investigation. But as a research, yes, that we have to agree. Thank you very I much. I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with Thank you, you sir. Uh, so, Dr. Kalevan, yeah, just have yours. Thank you, Dr. Indra. Thank you, Madhuri Kanika, ma'am. Uh, thanks for accepting our invite and being here. It was really great hearing to experts. And uh, Dr. Indra, your talk was really an evidence on how much of hard work has gone in. And uh, Madhuri, madam, as it's uh, known, your master's in avoiding disorders, it was really great listening to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so very much, ma'am. Rajiv Sinha, thanks for the excellent uh, discussion, sir. Thank you, sir. I think uh, next we'll move on to the polling session for the trainees. I think if faculties are okay staying back, we are still fine. Or uh, if it is, we are running short of time, you can also leave. Uh, I think I'll excuse myself. Thank you so much. It was thank such you. a pleasure to be here. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you as well. Appreciate it. I should really Have thank Dr. Amrish for sketching out such a wonderful scientific program with the apt speakers. Thank you, Dr. Amrish, too. So thank you. Happy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and, you. And congratulations again. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we'll move on to the polling session. Uh, kind of participants kindly excuse because like we are uh, too late. Can we launch the polling session? Before that, we'll just have a short review of the instruction for the polling session. So I request all the participants to enter a proper email ID for ease of communication. And totally, we have we are done with three polling sessions, and we have seven more to go. And uh, totally, we have ten questions, and it is ma mandatory to answer all the ten questions to proceed with the submission. And we have uh, three star questions in each discussion, and that is taken into consideration only in case of tie. And totally, the minutes allotted is only six minutes for today's polling session and uh, we'll go ahead with the polling session. So the allotted time is going to be only six minutes.
we have 40 seconds more. Last 10 seconds. I think we are done with the polling session. Thank you, Dr. Amrish. I think the discussion went on well and it was an extensive discussion too. Yep. Thank you everyone for staying back. Looking forward to the next session. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.